right, good afternoon and welcome to our Grow Native webinar, Gardens of Excellence, Urban Native Landscape Design with Will Gibson and Chris Carl. My name is Emily and I'm the Operations Coordinator for the Missouri Prairie Foundation. I want to thank you all for joining us for this webinar today and thanks to our 2024 Grow Native sponsors. During the presentation, if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A section on your screen. And at the end, I will read those out to our presenters. Please indicate if your question is specifically for Will or for Chris. This webinar is being recorded and the link will be shared with all of you tomorrow, along with resources mentioned during the presentation and the Q&A session. Created in 2021, the Grow Native Native Gardens of Excellence program features plantings of native plants in designed, well-maintained gardens and in other native landscape plantings in the lower Midwest. The gardens and landscape plantings selected and showcased in this program are not limited by size, scope, or professional involvement. Some have been designed by landscape architects or designers, while others are informal seeded landscapes, and some are professionally maintained, while others are maintained by volunteers. The Grow Native Gardens of Excellence are located in a variety of settings, ranging from multi-acre plantings associated with commercial properties, formal urban gardens, and even small community plots. All Grow Native Gardens of Excellence are open to the public, consist of at least 90% native plants, excluding cultivars and nativars, and are at least three years old with an established maintenance schedule. Will Gibson will discuss design details of the Bridge Space Native Gardens in Lee's Summit and remodel more native gardens in Kansas City, Missouri. Will is the founder of Down to Earth Services and Green Thumb Gardens in Kansas City, dedicated to the preservation and restoration of native plant communities. Will focused his businesses on designing, building and maintaining landscapes with native plants and regenerative solutions. Will's background and education are in environmental history and political science. After receiving a dual degree from the University of Missouri, Columbia, he returned to the KC region and started his path as an entrepreneur. Will is a vocal advocate for changes in the green industry and workforce development. Chris Carl, who is our second presenter, will discuss the inception and the growth of the pilot plot gardens he designed in Granite City, Illinois. Chris is an artist working with landscapes and gardens. After receiving his master's degree in landscape architecture from the University of Illinois, Champaign-Urbana, Chris established Studio Land Arts in Belleville, Illinois, which focuses on landscaping as a medium for creating art in landscapes and exploring garden form. So we will hear from Will first. So Will, when you are ready, you can share your screen and take it away. All right, are we seeing that? Looks okay. good, Will. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thanks for taking some time to talk about landscapes today. Uh, as they've already mentioned, my name is Will Gibson, and I'm um, the owner of Down to Services and several other companies that all specialize in working with native plants, providing design, build services, uh, growing plants, and then also providing maintenance. Uh, one of the kind of tenets that we kind of use to get ourselves here is that we are always trying to think globally and act locally. We, small changes in our in our landscapes uh, at a residential level or commercial level can have big effects on the environment. And that's part of why we work so hard to get every single plant we can in the ground is to see the proliferation of these sorts of uh, landscapes. So to get into, so nobody gets too confused here, we have several different entities here. Down Earth Services is our original company that was founded in 2013. Since then, we've also branched off and created a design and consulting business called Common Nature. And for those of you that are familiar with us, we also have a nursery operation called Green Thumb Gardens. Um, they, everything is currently housed at our website, dekc.com, where you can go and 
reach out to us or view more of our work. But in a nutshell, we are all about creating space and trying to invite people to engage with nature. We see such a big departure from that in standard design and standard landscape plans. So just some examples of um, our work with at a residential and a commercial level, you know, we try to use the same, you know, overarching concepts of building plant communities that will be resilient in the long term and will provide the aesthetic goals that our clients need. Uh, we do not limit ourselves simply to landscape design, but also offer a, an array of other services that would go into the build operation from hardscape services uh, to lighting, to water features. Um, we try to incorporate all of those systems within our, our native landscape. So anywhere we can put a, nat a native plant in the ground, we're going to try, but we're also going to try to create ways for you to interact with that landscape better. You know, it, it's one thing to look out your window and see a landscape, but it's also, you know, the ability to walk through and engage and see your landscape from different angles that really appeals to us. So having walkways and places to go within your landscape are, are critical to the things that we try to do. So to jump into our first project here, um, the bridge space was originally the old downtown Lee Summit post office. Uh, these are some pictures I pulled from Google. So apologies for the giant pole in the way there, but you can get a feel for um, what this looked like, kind of just a concrete, you know, barren area. It was then purchased by a man named Ben Rayo who formed Bridge Space. It's a co-work space that's now housed inside of this. And if you ever leave some area, you can, you're, they offer tours. It's a really, really cool area where different entrepreneurs can go and, and you know, just co-work, right? But they needed to do something with the landscape, and so they reached out to us. Uh, there's not, this isn't a big landscape by any means, and um, it's, a, for, for all intents and purposes, a very simple landscape. Um, it, it's a small space. If you can see in this left picture, this kind of vegetation growing there, and then on the left side of the doors, that's what this is all, that encompasses everything that, that's involved in this. Um, but this is the, the front entrance. This is where they have a lot of their signage. And so we don't have too many uh, pre-photos of this other than what you just saw on Google, but this, these are some images as the landscape started to come alive. It really started to, it, you know, the, the restrictions were imposed upon us were this very small strip, but yet it's such a big building. You know, I think if we could have had our way, we would, this landscape would be more proportion, proportionate to the actual building, but we tried to do the best we could to work within that that challenge. So as you know, plants love to flop over. So this has been a common you know, theme that we've had to work, work on here. Uh, you could even say maybe one of the things that has been a design, I would say a flaw, but something that's required our maintenance to pick up the slack. Um, this is you know, something I want to touch on a little bit more is just the need or you can design something and put it in the ground and you can let those plants move around uh, and do whatever they want. We have plenty of clients that have us do that. Sometimes, however, though, we want to try to keep the design intent intact. And so that requires uh, you know, removal of plants if they're moving outside of the footprint that we don't want. It includes things like trying to keep things off of our sidewalks. That's, you know, almost a standard in any sort of, you know, commercial spec is you don't want to see flop on sidewalks. You can achieve a lot of that by preventative maintenance, trimming flowering plants back earlier in the season, keeping sedges and grasses cut back. Uh, as they start to flop so that they, they don't give that, that kind of messy look. It, it can turn messy very quick. But because this was such a small space, we unfortunately try to limit the amount of plant species that we had. This kind of seems counterintuitive to what we do, but uh, we wanted to make sure we were very legible uh, from afar. We wanted to be able to kind of make a statement as much as possible while not seeming too busy. Um, so there are as many species as maybe in some of our work. It's a very cool interactive um, landscape that also engaged so much with the community with this being this, this, this transformation of this, this old post office that 
you know, because you could say it was starting to blight the area, but now it's been transformed. They do all sorts of events here. Um, we also work with them and they allow us to use the space for retreats or, or you know, any sort of uh, engagements that we need in there. Uh, I wish I had more photos of the inside because it really is just super cool. They put a ton of artwork in there. And uh, it, it just, it's really something cool to bring into downtown Lee Summit. Um, you know, here you can see again what happens. We've got some Coreopsis starting to flop over on the sidewalk. While it's still blooming, we try to give it as much time to bloom, but eventually we're going to cut that back and try to keep that uh, restrained behind that, that sidewalk. Uh, the bed does feature some different plants as you start to work around the corner there. You know, we've got our Baptizia over here. And I uh, just wanted to show that there's more than just four or five plants in here. There's my kids. Um, so here's a big part of what we do when we try to layer with native plants is, you know, the idea of the green mulch. I'm sure to most people listening, that's nothing new. Uh, this is a combination that I'm, I'm a pretty big fan of, Robin's Plantain and um, Golden Groundsel. They can grow right up against each other. They kind of, you know, the, the white and, and yellow can provide a pretty cool look in the early spring and then of course they just go back down and allow other plants to come over the top of them the way nature intended and so that's how we can have so many plants in one square foot uh but this is in the early spring and several years ago uh here is a picture of what it might look like it, it, after cutback so this would be you know March-ish, sometime in there when we would perform cutbacks, we are, of course, going to leave that plant material up as the best we can through the winter uh, for lots of ecological reasons and for aesthetic reasons. We will trim things back strategically throughout the year. And, of course, if it starts to flop and look messy in the winter, we will, of course, get in there and do that as well. As you can see, uh, weeds do get in here. And so maintenance is something that is constant on a site like this. Part of those issues that we found would in terms of maintenance are things like sidewalks and parking lots getting ice melt repetitively over the winter will cause dieback along edges uh, as well as you know the the people who love to cut corners as they're walking and, and will walk through plant beds so these are kind of things that we've um, had to you know kind of grow with and anticipate and so replacing plants and um, building that into our maintenance program has been uh, one of the things that has allowed this uh, to succeed out here. Okay, the next site we did is not in Lee Summit. It's in uh, the Kansas City area. It's in the Martini Corner uh, district or area, if you're familiar with that area. Um, so this site has also got a kind of cool backstory to it as well. The, the owners are, um, they have a remodeling company. Uh, a, a residential remodeling company, and they had acquired this uh, vacant lot that was once a building that had been knocked down, and they were trying to build a memorial garden for a, a family member. And so they called us and asked, you know, what kind of stuff, you know, what can we do? So we, back in 2019, this was a very long while back there, um, we came up with the design. We're trying to again build space. We wanted to create a. They wanted a space where they could have meetings um, that the public could come to, which is why it was able to be a garden of excellence, and just something that kind of brought more, you know, life into this area. It's, there's a lot of concrete. There's not a lot of plantings, and so as you drive up and down the street, it's just kind of a really cool thing to see. It kind of draws your attention over there. It it features a water feature. It features. Um, a, a, uh, a gas um, fireplace, as well as some big limestone slabs that people can sit on. And again, you know, this, this design is meant to carry you through the garden and um, not just, again, look at it at afar. Um, so you can have all these cool different perspectives as you, as you walk through it. So some of the things that went into this, you know, kind of, and these are things I wanted to talk about because these are things that I consider every time I do a design. Um, so these are my, you know, kind of standard design considerations is on a spectrum from wild to formal, what do we need? What does the client want? What does the site require? Uh, wild, you know, we're gonna, it's more mimetic of nature. It's, you're gonna have 
random clusterings of plants uh, dependent on their species and how they would naturally grow all the way up to, you know, a very formal setting where we, we are trying to have much more legibility in our design, where we want to be able to understand the design from farther away. And that means bigger drifts and bigger swaths of things. Um, you know, I try as a designer not to just have one format. I try to change that up dependent on what is required by the client and the site. Uh, some other site considerations are where this is, for example, is in an urban area. So we've got we've got people that um, are you know can can get out can get into the space at night. They can you know we can have various problems from from time to time, uh, as well as you know pollution and trash. The having been a former building that was knocked down meant that the soils were and we've got a picture of that in here going to be a, a challenge as they just were full of construction debris. Uh, the surrounding area, there's the, there's this building, right, that just jumps up out of the side. And so it, it really posed a, a, a challenge as to, like, how to kind of step up into that height in such a small area. And then, again, function played a big role in, in how we designed this as well because the client uh, wanted to be able to walk through this and have meetings in it and kind of make this community space. So that also, also got taken into it. Uh, the legibility of the design, I kind of had already mentioned that, but that there, there's levels to that depending on what we need. But uh, the idea of, you know, I'm a big fan of, and again, not formally trained in any of this, but um, just kind of <laughs> gut feeling, I guess, is I always try to look at vantage points. I try to go to the places that you're going to most commonly be viewing something and try to design from those vantage points. And so when we're doing something really formal, I'll go to those points and, and try to tr have drifts and swaths that lead the eye or invoke us to try to engage with the landscape. So the legibility of design is just something I've just typed in here and coined, I guess. But um, it, it is something that I can ramp up or down, and, and it depends, you know, it kind of factors in with all these site considerations. And the biggest thing that we can talk about today, and I'm sure plenty of you will have plenty of questions about this, is maintenance um you know every client that i have we we stress over and over and over again before we ever get started the importance of maintenance and native plantings it seems to be still uh, as the industry has grown as there are more designers there's more growers we still have a huge lack in the maintenance realm and the importance of it is so critical i think that the majority of plantings that i've seen fail are failing typically in those first couple of years typically something related to maintenance and so making sure that we have a plan of how to maintain these things uh as we implement them is so critical um you know i i have it's kind of a running joke that i i have clients ask for low maintenance nobody's ever ever as long as i've done this said hey can i get a medium or high maintenance landscape everybody wants a low maintenance landscape and native plants have been marketed as such, and they, they are for 100%, but we have to get them there. We have to put in some hard work in the first year, the second year. Um, there are lots of tricks that we can cut, you know, implement to try to expedite getting this thing as healthy as possible. And when we can do that, you know, sometimes we can have a planting that is just off the races in that first year. Most often it's two years, sometimes it's even three years. Thus, the sayings that everybody loves to throw around, the first year they leap, the second year they creep, the third year, I just messed that up. Yeah, <laughs> apologies. Um, but again, this is something that, you know, as we've grown as a company, we are trying more and more to require some sort of a maintenance plan to be in place, whether that's by our company providing it or the client or another contractor. If, if there's not, if this hasn't been thought through, if the client didn't anticipate the scope of what they're doing and, and how much uh, maintenance is going to be required, you know, sometimes we step away from those sorts of projects because we we see those as, you know, we, we're looking for win-wins. And when we have something that fails, uh, not only is that, you know, something that's horrible for the client, uh, it's not good for us, but also, you know, the, the, the people that live in these areas see those things and, and I, I really think that they then go, oh, this, this is this is what native plants are. And then we've just lost all these potential conversions 
And um, so again, maintenance, so critical. We are, as a company, this is something that we're going to continue to try to lead in and develop more content on and, um, you know, try to engage and educate people uh, how critical and then how, how the steps that you need to do to get that. But eventually the goal is these plants all grow together. They form that plant community. And that is when we kind of start to get that self-policing. That is when the native plants become low maintenance and, uh, and you, you know, can go on autopilot if you want. That's also when that design intent can kick in. Um, you know, how much design intent are we going to see? So just to kind of go into that a little bit deeper with the designs, you know, one concept that we will implement when we are doing designs is, is, you know, nothing, you know, we didn't, we're no innovators here, but the idea of layering, right? And um, so we will, when we're trying to be more formal, having big drifts or swaths of sedges or grasses is one of the solutions that we can make things very easy to translate in our brains. And so these colors, these bigger swaths in this design are, uh, going to be matrices of sedges or grasses that are then overlaid on top of with perennials and shrubs and all the great things that we want. But those things can kind of be that bread and butter that is our, um, you know, builds in that, that, that legibility into the design. Uh, on that side, we talked about the soils. Here's a, a picture, and I don't think it does it any justice of just how, you know, this is us digging down the ground so far. I mean, there's brick. There was trash. Uh, the soils were not good, which is common and not always that big of a deal. I think sometimes we, we, everybody just gets really caught up on their soils. Native plants are indigenous to the area, and they are many of them are just you know they're used to our crappy soils, right? This is what they, they've, uh, <laughs> this is what they're used. To. So, but. Uh, as a standard practice, we will almost always, you know, bring in, you know, cardboard and then compost and mulch on, on top of that. The extent to which we need to do these things is dictated by the quality of the soils. At a minimum, we're going to put a few inches of compost on initial planting. When it's something worse, sometimes we need to actually go in and amend the soils, you know, as it can go down a foot if we needed to, to try to get some of that stuff out of there. It's just all dependent on, on you know, in this instance, there's there's the landscape debris um, that's polluting the soils at some, some, to some extent. So soils do matter and, you know, not to downplay that by any means, it's something that can help your planting get off to the races if you have healthy soil. Um, so here's some pictures from the construction phase. Um, Obviously, like these hardscape features, these these functional things that always need to go in first, usually because you know you don't want to have to go in over planting. So again, when we talk about design uh, and we get to you know an estimation phase with the client, it's really important to be able to say, "Listen, we know you called us because you want plants, but we decided we want to do these things too, and these things have to happen first. So a lot of our clients break projects apart, and they might do the hardscape pieces first. You know, so on and so forth. Um, one of the cool things I thought about this design is these giant pieces of flags. And I'm a big, big fan. I, I don't, I, I, it drives me insane to see small pieces of flagstone uh, used in, in some sort of a, a walking or a stepper capacity. I love, however, these big pieces. Um, they can, you can plant plants right around them. The plants can kind of start to grow up onto them a little bit and you still have such a giant step. If it's a small piece, it gets lost uh, pretty quick. And so these uh, were something that we were able to source locally in Kansas City. Um, so, I mean, this is, this is an option for anybody across the whole Grow Native, you know, there is gonna be a place where you can source these things. Um, we've got these giant, Bet I think these are Bethany Falls lime limestones here, big, big slabs that we got at Sturgis here in Kansas City. Um, kind of, a, you know, anybody go get those? They were kind of a, a custom order thing, but these, this is the area that the owner was hoping to bring his you know, clients or have meetings with his staff at. And that orange circle is what will eventually, you can see it's been stubbed out there for gas. Um, he has a really cool, which I think we have pictures of. And then of course, this uh, dugout area is going to eventually be a water feature. So here in the top, well, they're missing the picture there, but here in the top uh, left there, we've got 
for future. Now, um, you know, if I could go back in time, uh, I have stopped trying to use as much cobblestone. I think, you know, guilty as charged. That is something that I have seen a lot in standard landscaping is um, this Colorado-esque look. And, uh, you know, I, I used, I mean, of course the plantings aren't, but I did use that rock. I think in hindsight, I would have gone with more natural. I mean, we use natural flagstone, uh, you know, or locally, uh, local flagstone and local, the seats are made of local, um, stone. So I think in hindsight to get those things to synergize better, I would have changed that out, but I don't think it's, uh, you, you know, it's not a horrible loss there. Uh, we do have some pictures at various stages here as well. Uh, the bottom left, you can see things in full tilt. Uh, they do have the, that's probably what was in this top right picture was a better picture of this uh, really cool um, fire uh, pit that the, the owner picked out. It's one of these, you know, allowed to rust over and it looks really neat. And then down here in the bottom right, we've got more of like what these things are going to look like in the fall, right? Um, we leave a lot of that up. We still get a lot of color out of it. Uh, you know, I think that, winter uh in, interest in, in landscape native landscapes is something that gets ignored a little bit and um so you know I'm, I'm a big fan of trying to incorporate that into designs as well i mean a lot of these things just look really neat in the winter and if they stay vertical i think that's the key to success for that winter interest you know if it's starting to flop over however like a grass for example you can trim the edges of it and we can leave the, the you know the pieces that are you know stay straight up can can be left um, and then again, if they do start to, you know, big ice storm or something like cause those to lay over, we can always go back in and, and cut them if we need to. And that's, you know, not to get into all the ecological benefits or, or things that you lose by doing that. Um, Cause at the end of the day, we are also trying to be this bridge, right? Between what we, what, you know, standard landscaping would provide. Um, it, you know, we don't want these things to look super messy in the winter. Um, you know, we do leave leaf material. I also think, though, that I see a lot of people who just leave all their leaves. And uh, I, I think that might be a mistake. I will maybe do multiple kind of cleanouts of the leaves and then leave the last, you know, maybe break it into three or two and leave the last set of leaves down. And, um, to get the benefits of all that, right? But I don't just let all the leaves lay there. Um, you can get too much leaf material built up and it can inhibit the, the, these plants from growing together and forming that plant community. It can also snuff out existing plants uh, if they're too dense and they're just left. So um, I, I see, a, I think that might be a mistake that I see sometimes in this movement to leave leaves on, the leaves on site. Um, there is an extent to that, right? Uh, you've got a bunch of trees in your yard you're going to have to remove some, some leaves. Obviously not a big issue here. We don't, as you can see, there's just concrete buildings everywhere. And uh, we're going to try this. So hopefully everybody can see this, but this is a video of um, the water. You can walk right across it. Uh, these big slabs were great to lead you, you know, keep you dry as you, you, you navigate through that. Yeah, so this was prior to like a lot of plantings going in. You can see that it's still open, but I just wanted people to give, you know, an idea of what this, this water feature does. He's, the, the, the clients have told me that, you know, they'll just have people that they don't even know just, just sitting out here uh, eating lunch, reading books. And I think that that that's the whole reason I do this. I think that that's just super cool. Oh, now I know. Uh, another another picture there. I think we might have shown this one from a different angle. Got the side oats. Big fan of the side oats. Plant spacing. Uh, this is maybe one of the last few things I'm going to talk about today. Is you know because I think that this is something that maybe is can be a problem. Uh, is Spacing of plants, right? We can space plants in this bottom left picture. This was a big um, work for Johnson County Parks and Rec. And it was so big that they increased spacing to, you know, work within a budget, right? And um, it, it works if you provide the maintenance. It is going to take longer for something like this to fill in because of the those. And while that stuff is taking longer, we now have free real estate for 
weeds if we're not keeping it mulched. Um, I'm not a big fan of mulch. I will put it down in the initial phase as such as here, but I'm not, we're not going to try to come back in and mulch. That's not, I think it's counterintuitive. It does inhibit weeds, but it's also inhibiting the natives from spreading and growing and reaching these stages where they grow together, which is what we're ultimately trying to get, uh, you know, as we try to get this low maintenance effect. So mulch and mulching year after year or going in and mulching, I think is, um, can be detrimental uh, or definitely not allowing your, your planting to progress. So plant spacing, if you want to get there quicker, you need to put more plants in the ground. You need to have, um, you know, we, you know, like a commercial project, they will spec three plants per square foot. That's crazy. I mean, for a residential client, you know, that's a lot of plants, but that is how you get these things off the ground quicker. If you are, you know, trying to, work within a budget and so you're thinking oh, i'll just space them further apart i would recommend just doing a smaller area and maybe making it more densely packed with plants i think you're going to be better off in the long run the picture on the, the the background picture there you know again having those plant i mean this one could have some more plants filled in, in in it so um but it still is more full in the second year than this planting in the bottom left so Spacing and, um, you know, it's something I think we need to talk more about. Uh, and I hope that people will take that into consideration. Uh, just a few more pictures there. I really, for whatever reason, have been kind of crazy about this side oats on this brick wall. I just thought it was super cool. So you have to look at it more than once. And um, just to kind of wrap up here, you know, if you're interested in visiting our work or, or getting more information out of us, um, you can reach us through our website and fill a contact form or try to, you know, view our work that way. We, uh, and then again, just a, you know, purely uh, self-promotion here. We have at, had a client, the Chive and Transparent Brewery in Grandview. They've done just a ton of native plantings and stormwater work with native plantings on their site. So please go check them out, have a beer, have some food. They uh, just hired us to do our very first living wall and we are doing the living wall with native plants which from this company i understand has not ever been done according to them so stay tuned we'll post it up on our website and potentially social media as well so you can see what a living wall made out of native plants looks like and um that's it thanks for your time i hope i didn't go over and uh, i will answer questions on the back end all right thank you so much will uh chris uh is up next chris when you're ready and uh, you can share your screen and uh, share your presentation. Thank you. Hi. Are you there? Yep, we can hear you, Chris. Thank you. Okay, great. Thanks. All right. So thanks for having me. My name is Chris Carl. Um, I uh, really appreciate what Grow Native does. It's a pretty amazing organization. We're lucky to have it. So we're real uh, happy to be part of the Gardens of Excellence. Um, I'm going to talk to you today about a garden called Pilot Plot. And uh, it's a garden... Uh, that's situated, here's a map you can see, the little star there, that's in Granite City, Illinois. So you can see on, that's the Mississippi River. And uh, to the left is obviously St. Louis and to the right is the Great American Bottoms. And that's where we're located. Let me see how to advance my screen here. Uh, okay, hold on, technical issues. Okay, so here's the site uh, before we planted a garden, obviously. Um, we're sharing the site. It was a kind of a collaborative effort with the MCT, the Madison County Transit, which is the bus station there. And the little building there is uh, my little shop space and then the city of Granite City. Just the his history of the site, you know, Granite City is kind of one of these steel mill towns. It's where U.S. Steel is. You know, you've probably seen it in the news lately. 
and a lot of industry it was sort of built around industry. So, you know, on our street, we used to have a, you know, there was a, an electric line and this is the corner of 19th and state street, by the way, where the garden is. So you can kind of get a feel for, you can tell by, you know, the cars, how old, how old this photo is. And we even further back, this is the actual lot where obviously these, these buildings are no longer, um, Granite city was flooded with immigrants at one point from Macedonia, Mexico, many other places to come work in the, in the steel mill. This photo is from 1907 and this is the Tully building. This is what stood at a uh, pilot plot. This is a, a postcard, which I love to show because it's a vision of what it would be like to be in Granite City, to move to Granite City and work in the mill, you know, kind of like one of these, uh, a little prairie path, you know, that kind of uh, exists alongside, you know, the industrial uh, project. And this is, uh, you know, a historical photo, probably, I, I don't really know when exactly the photo is, but behind the smoke there, this is Granite City Steel, by the way, but behind the smoke there is Pilot Plot. So you can kind of get a feel for, you know, what Granite City has been built around and the kind of landscape that we're dealing with. So before I disparage Granite City, I don't want anyone to think I'm doing that. I mean, it's a wonderful place. There's so many wonderful people there. But there is a legacy of industry, and industry oftentimes leaves behind uh, unfortunate sort of contamination. So um, the little circles here that you see are super fun sites. And on one hand, that seems like a negative, but but they are sites that have been cleaned, so they're looking towards the future. And so one of the things that the the garden was initially set out to do was to be a rainscape. You know, rainscaping something that I learned through grad school, of course, but also through the great work of the Missouri Botanical Gardens and uh, uh, MSD that have a rainscaping program and do so much to, 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 you know, educate people on what a rainscape is. So this is actually the street um, because we're in the American bottoms, you know, before they built the levees tall enough, it would often flood. So this is actually like a flatboat on 19th Street. Again, probably what is this, maybe the 40s. Flooding has been kind of an issue there. And to this day, this is just, you know, this is Granite City Steel there. You know, we still, you know, get backed up if it's too it's too wet. You know, it's just, it's a wetland. It's kind of always going to be a wetland. It always wants to express itself as a wetland. So our initial design, this is the lot. This is our, our rendering, you know. And uh, of course, it's like got all these really great flowers. It looks like it's going to bloom forever. And this is us envisioning what we could do there. We sort of thought of a kind of agricultural uh, feel, you know, where we would have these rows of plants that would grow pretty nearly similar things. And we would collect seed from them and grow these seeds out and kind of try to propagate this kind of plant material out into the world. And, you know, we're always thinking about, you know, of course, maintenance, because that's always the thing that people get really uptight about when you're talking about native plants. So you can see that with this rendering, you see the little the little mower in there. We always want to include that so we, we know that our, our widths are big enough to fit a zero-turn mower so it'd be easier to uh, maintain. This is it after we built it. It's kind of an interesting thing because of the nature of the work that I do. You know, I, I do have a degree in landscape architecture, and I mean, I do draw, but I also make the stuff. So I'm able to sort of draw things and then decide what to do while we're making it. So it's very similar to an artwork in that way where we're sculpturally kind of making things in a certain way where we're not, it's not exactly design because we don't have to stick to design. We're trying to uh, uh, um, oh, you guys, <laughs> sorry, my family just got into the car. We're on a trip. Okay, so we're trying to uh, we can make changes along the way. So like a design is sort of a set instruction um, and that's great. So you can hand that off to someone it can efficiently be made. But for us, uh, we can we we have sort of the power, I guess you could say, to change the design along the way. But here you can see all the different aspects of the rain garden. So we did in fact continue with the swath idea. Um, and this is after a really large storm after we completed the construction. And you can kind of see we're capturing rainwater from the from these buildings in the back and from the alleyways. And it's doing a pretty good job of that. This is, you know, I think was 72 hours later, maybe 24, I can't remember, but it works really well there. We have a really sandy kind of soil. So the infiltration is really, really great. 
So we got lucky in that regard because, you know, secret, we didn't do a soil test. And we, we, we used two different ways of, of, uh, of planting. So we did a seeded route where we kind of got seed mixes from all the folks you've probably heard of and tried in each one of our swaths a different seed mix. So this is us, you know, doing seed. And then we use this seed mat to protect everything over winter. Of course, we planted in fall. This is a picture of that. So the areas that you see that have the mat are obviously the ones that we seeded. And then the areas in the back where you can kind of see this zigzagging thing, that's the low point of our, of our rain garden. And we actually planted plants there. Because plants come in faster and there's a lot more, uh, you know, you get that fat, you get that kind of instant gratification with the plants. And this is just it after the first year. I like to show this photo because it's not like a beautiful photo or anything, but it really shows you this kind of awkward teenager phase of the garden. This is the first year. So you can see in the back where we, in the low point of our garden, where we had planted plants, I mean, that's doing really well. So you can imagine if you did the entire landscape like that, that would be great. Of course, cost constraints. And then the seeded prairies are coming in pretty slow, but steady. I put the slide in here because it's not what we've done as far as mowing. This isn't how we maintain it necessarily, but this is a really good photograph that speaks to communication. So I failed to communicate with the maintenance department of Granite City because our lot is a shared lot between MCT, uh, Granite City, and uh, Studio Land Arts. And uh, the first year, this is the first year we, we planted plants. All those plants that are mown there are the plants that we planted. <laughs> and then we had some really, I think this is maybe like May, we had some really nice things coming up as seeds and uh, the city came in and mowed everything. So that of course was, you know, aggravating. But once I realized that actually it was my mistake and not communicating with the, the maintenance department that, hey, you know, this is, this is not a normal landscape. You know, we're trying to do something different here. It seems obvious we've done all these things, but it's not so obvious, I guess. This is just the layout of the design here. You can see we're, we're working from a drawing, you know, to lay everything out. But we make changes along the way. This is kind of the swaths. This is maybe this is maybe the second year. Um, so things have come in pretty well. These are these mixes from uh, the companies that I've, I mentioned that probably everyone knows, but I don't know if I can mention them here or not. I don't know. And this is uh, a recent photograph with our proliferation of I think bone set and a lot of a lot of goldenrod people get really up, uptight about goldenrod too but it's a it's a I like to call it a solid citizen it's a great plant to have it smells wonderful the creatures love it you know people love it this is kind of after construction so this is when the gardens after a big rain started to fill with water and I admittedly got really nervous about this because they really worked um, but you will never, ever see this amount of water in the gardens any longer because we have so much plant material in there that there's really no standing water for any period of time. And it's never standing that deep. So these are some of the, again, like this low point of our rain garden after it filled up after a storm. And you can also kind of see the material that we're using and reusing because as Will mentioned, I mean, all, everything in an urban environment now is filled with it's backfilled with the debris from whatever was torn down. So those buildings that I showed you earlier, those antique buildings, this is them. And we've, you know, created gabion baskets and filled the gabion baskets with brick and, you know, the foundation stones and so on and so forth. It's all right there. We didn't really have to bring much in. This begins to show you this little flag out here. As we developed a project, we're part of this thing called the Granite City Art and Design District. Uh, which is a couple of buildings across the street and some other gardens over there that perhaps we could talk about sometime. Uh, this is a, a gallery space, actually, this flag. It's called Standard. And we have a rotating uh, a call for artists to come and make uh, flags here. This is, I think, I'm going to say probably the first one. It feels like such a long time ago. Some of the uh, hard parts of the garden, you know, it's always... One of the concepts is with the gardens that we're making is to try to incorporate some sort of uh, hard part in it that shows that there's 
that it's not just a, a wild cacophony of plants, that we have some hard edges, some lines that you can see, concrete pieces and so on. This is us planting the the low point in the in the rain garden plant material. I should say too that a lot of the plant material we grew on site. Um, we were able to purchase some stuff, but we were also have a, had a greenhouse, I should say, and uh, raised a lot of these plants as part of you know collected seed, purchased seed to use in this garden. This is the first year. This is showing last winter, I think. This is a, after really hard rain in the winter, and there's really only four inches in the in the low point of our of our uh, rain garden. So, as I said, there's really not a lot of water that accumulates there once the plant material is going. And then these are some slides of of the green monster. I should point out, you know, we did some signage here. You can see these little posts, and then this line of posts in the middle was a project that I have some slides I think I'll talk about in a, in a bit here. Some photos of our flags. This is one, another, again, a few more. Okay, a few more. It's a really great addition. We love having it. This is from the first year. So Lamium, you know, when I first saw this, it was a little bit like, oh, shoot, we're going to get all these weeds and stuff. But Lamium really is just a great plant, in my view, in the spring because it comes up first. It's purple and then it goes away and it really never comes back. This is a photo I put here because it shows one of the flags, but also if you look at the at the foot of that flag, you'll see some folks sleeping there. This kind of gets into some of the politics of the site, you know. It's a it's can be a rough area where we are and there are some people who don't have homes and and will use the gardens uh as a place to sleep and and other things. And so that's that's often puts us that often puts us at odds, you know, with people who obviously see that and would rather that not be the case. And so there tends to be an argument that'll come up that's like, well, you know, you got your tall plants there and people can hide behind there and sleep in there. And I, I suppose that's true, but you know, there's other tall things and they can hide behind those other tall things too in a city. So I don't know how much, I mean, it is a nice place to sleep. I would sleep there too. This guy's name is John, John Cunningham. He's no longer with us. He's the guy sleeping there. Asclepis incarnata and, you know, just love that plant. It's great. Here's some of the, some of the, you know, hardscape infrastructure, I guess you'd call it, these gabion baskets. The foot of the sign there is a little, a little bird bath kind of thing that we put in there. And all these curbs are also gutters. So the curbs kind of move around the site or move water around the site. Some signage that we did, we were able to do uh, signage. I should also say that, I mean, well, we'll get to it, I suppose. This is that photo we saw of Dr. Tully's building. This is us building it. So we're not typically, you know, landscapers in a way. I mean, like that is what I do because, you know, I have shovels and I wear green sometimes and I, you know, like plants. and <laughs> We do concrete, but please don't call us. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but there's, uh, you know, the people that we hire and the people that we work with are typically artists. So they're people who have skill sets and they can build things, but they're not necessarily building landscape stuff. So we're so fortunate to bring people in to, you know, artists, musicians that want to know about plants and, you know, have an interest in that and help us do this, you know, what's typically very hard work. This is a guy, you know, who came in from Minnesota that we know who is an artist who helped us do this hardscape stuff. Here's kind of a, you know, after installation shot. So you can see these, 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 uh, these gutters here and these different, you know, pathways for the, for the water to flow through the site. So we got a grant early on uh, through the Pulitzer Arts Foundation. They had piles of bricks from a, uh, uh, from a project that they were doing and they were granting the piles of bricks out for people to make things. So we proposed 
making a hundred foot long table and taking the bricks and actually having them crushed. So we, Surbeyer and Surmeyer and Caseyville is a company that has big brick crushers. And we sent them there and uh, they smashed them up in this big machine and then dumped them off at our site. And then we made concrete out of those. So this is us mixing that concrete and we're making this, uh, the armature for, I don't know, I guess these like piles or, you know, these baller type things to carry this uh, table. This is them as they're coming out of their molds. And this is the table. I'm sorry, I don't have really, it's not a, it's not a really beautiful shot, but at least you could get the, the picture of what we're doing. We're using really inexpensive materials. I mean, these are just two by tens, I think, you know. And our first event there was a cereal event. So we had a morning time cereal event on this 100, 100 foot long table. And then uh, there's a, a chef, I'm dropping his name right now, but he's got a really cool restaurant called Bull Rush in St. Louis. And uh, he was uh, came out uh, through an art program that we had uh, and did uh, a food tasting along the 100 foot long table. And a lot of the food that he makes, you know, it's all like foraged food and, and you know, food that you could get locally. It's really interesting. So another bit to this is, you know, back to the contamination idea, the legacy of, of contamination, uh, the University of Illinois extension and University of Illinois uh, proper came together to Granite City to do a soil testing. And we took a bunch of soil bags from, from our site and, and asked them to test that. And they have this really cool gun, I guess, or phasers, kind of a Star Trek type thing that they can give you an instant readout of the, of the content of heavy metals. And so all of our soils were fine, except for one site, and uh, which is associated with Pilot Plot, which had some outrageous amount of lead contamination. So they decided to do an experiment there to test a tomato plant that had a relationship with some kind of mycorrhizal fungi. And they were going to plant this thing there and see if it uptook, if that's a word, if it would uptake the heavy metals into the fruiting body. So this is them gritting this thing out. Um, very scientific. It was fun to see. Little baggies of soil. They came back to check them. I think this is actually when they came back to dig them up. They took the roots, the stems, and the fruiting bodies and took them back to the laboratory to test them. Um, we, I don't exactly know how it turned out, but I did contact Andrew Marginot, who is the scientist, and he said that preliminarily... Uh, the fruiting bodies of the tomatoes did not uptake lead. So I guess that's a positive. I'm not sure if it had anything to do with the mycorrhizal fungi or not. If it's just that fruiting bodies don't pick up lead, I don't know. So then we were faced with, you know, what do you do with something like this when you're, when you're finished? And so we kind of like took the lead of, you know, the Superfund site and which essentially they just get capped um, and planted. So we put a mound on top of our site and then built little benches uh, real kind of simple benches with these uh, markers and, you know, exclamation point, like, you know, beware, there's lead here. Made these little seeds. It's a nice place now, you know, just don't dig there, I guess, or don't put the dirt in your mouth. These are just images of the garden, you know. This is a rain garden now. After a rain, you can see there's not quite, not very much uh, water in there. Beautiful hibiscus. This is a plant called Gara, which uh, was in one of the mixes. Um, it made me a little nervous at first because it does look very weedy. And we're trying to be conscious of that. I mean, we, we really want it to be really looking weedy, but we're also trying to like strike a balance so that people don't get too upset, offended. So this is one that I we thinned for a while, but and it really has some great qualities. It, it's blooming when nothing else is blooming. And... Well, not much else is blooming, I should say. And it gets a really nice fall color sometimes. I'm not sure why sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't, but it's really beautiful, dark burgundy. Uh, you know, can't go wrong with a winter shot. So one of the things that we've done recently with the site is uh, working with uh, 
the Cool Cities Committee, which is a committee in Granite City, which really I have slides later to talk to that. But there's a, a restoration site on the outskirts of town uh, that is supposed to be a, a, a woodland restoration project. And it, and it is. It's a really great site. Um, but over the past couple of three years here, we've been raising up kind of the, being the interme intermediary between um, forest relief and uh and, the, and this project out on the edge of town. So we'll get a bunch of plants and trees and we'll pot them up or they come potted. We've also potted trees and we keep them here on the site and then uh, slowly trickle them out to the rest forest restoration project where we've planted, I don't know, I'm gonna guess 300 trees. Here's some of them out on the site. These, these are not the forest relief projects. These are the ones that we ordered, I think from the Missouri Department of Conservation, you know, when they come as uh, bare root kind of raise those up there, put them out. Always love to see this juxtaposition, you know, of the industry and also, you know, milkweed. It's very nice. This is us, you know, maintaining the thing. So maintenance is really important, you know. So one of the ideas behind the garden is it's really just maintained through mowing. So the pre, the, you know, the very first image I showed with that little mower in there, I mean, that was really a concept that we, we pushed through the thing. Where each time you mow it, you know, you're reinforcing the design again, you know, you're making the edges and it helps to create a juxtaposition with, you know, mown and not mown. Because as you can see in this photo, I mean, this is, this is a gnarly looking garden. I mean, this is, this just, this doesn't read garden to most people. So we're really trying to do as much as we can to, to make it known that this isn't just sitting here. There's people taking care of this all the time. So we're always picking up trash. We do a lot of preemptive gardening. In other words, we've learned what things to take out. So when we see it coming up, we get it out. This is what we're doing here is just going in and doing selective gardening. We've learned to really love these uh, DeWalt tools, you know, uh, that are electric now. So you don't have to use gas anymore and huff that, you know, that those fumes all day. These, uh, you know, brush cutters and, you know, hedge trimmers and chainsaws. It's amazing. It's really great. It's an investment, but it's well, well worth it. This is how we deal with the garden at the end of the year. So we just we just cut everything down and we do it by hand and we bundle it up. And then we take it to the Landscape Recycling Center. We leave the bundles out to kind of, you know, evoke a kind of agricultural feel. Also, again, just to show the public that something's happening here. People are taking care of it. There is a process. You know, we also, you know, collect seed from here, as I said. I mean, we've, you know, grown out lots and lots of plants from the seed, just from the site, working through the seeds here. It's an interesting site because Granite City is, you know, mixed politically. It's an old union town, but there's also like, you know, the Trump things going on there, which is, you know, I don't want to offend anyone. But it's kind of an interesting thing. We happen to be down working in the garden when uh, the president came to town to open up the steel mill again. So this is them right on the corner of 19th and State Street. Some of the folks that are associated with the art group there, you know, <laughs> have some, you know, some things to say here. I mean, it's not necessarily what I believe. You know, what's that thing that PBS will say? This, you know, the views expressed here are not necessarily those of the, you know, of myself, I guess. But... Uh, and then this is the group of people that were there to welcome uh, the president, Donald Trump. And uh, the interesting thing is that we were just doing weeding and stuff there that day. And I made sure that I, you know, walked by the crowd and anyone that was willing to turn around and talk to me and ask what it was. And we told them what it was. Everybody was like, oh, that's really cool. So here it is, you know, like this is really the the start of it all because things like this don't happen on their own. If it, I'm not from Granite City, I I went to Granite City to find affordable places to to work, to make work, and lo and behold, there was a group of people in town that were making a sustainability plan, and um, I asked to be part of that. And this is part of that group before I was there with the mayor of Granite City signing a declaration for the <laughs> sorry, I don't know, that's kind of weird, but for the uh, Cool Cities Committee which really was, you know, part and parcel. I mean, the main reason why the pilot plot exists, and this is them supporting us at like a, a Grow Native event, I believe. Again, the group. You know, and through that group and through work with other community gardens in Granite City, we've been able to get students to come and help out and, 
you know, do activities, planting plants and, you know, uh, cleaning up in, in the uh, spring and so on and so forth. This is an interesting slide because this is, uh, I forget the name of it off the top of my head, but it's like an Indian paintbrush. And it's like one that's like a plant that needs other plants to grow. And I was super excited to see it because I'd never seen it before one. And I thought, well, how is this possible that's growing here? But interesting thing about this plant is that it no longer grows there because someone would come and dig it up. And so that happened to a lot of our plants. I, I never would have expected that. It was an interesting thing. And, and it, you know, at first it's like one of those things you're like, well, that's really aggravating to me that people are stealing these plants. But then it's it dawned on me like, well, I guess that's good. It's like, you know, that, that book that like, please steal this. <laughs> it's like, yeah, go ahead, take them. But one of the things that stinks about it is that the uh, the diversity of of the plants there have kind of diminished over time. We've lost some plants. I think it's probably just part of the way that the plants grow and they they sort of take over really quickly. And also because people have come and looted the plants. That's actually my last slide. I, I hate to end on a on a bummer note. Uh, so I apologize for that. Well, thank you so much, Chris for uh, sharing all of that wonderful information about uh, the pilot plot and Will for sharing all of the wonderful information about the gardens of excellence that he has helped design and maintain. We do have a couple of questions. If you're willing to stick around for a couple of minutes past five, um, folks, had some questions about um, materials. So I'll ask that first. So one question was for you, Chris. Um, what was the cage material on the uh, Gabion baskets? Um, was that, were those, was that cattle fencing? What was that? Yeah, I think they call it hog panel. And you can get okay. it in a rural cage. And that's, uh, we, we just bought big pieces of it and then bent it ourselves. Since then, it's really hard material to work with. We've actually use a different kind of gaming material that we, you know, ordered. It was like a pre-made kind of basket thing. Okay, cool. Um, and then, Will, a question also about hardscaping and your designs. What material did you put under the large flagstones um, at the Remodel More Garden? If you remember. <laughs> agree. Will, I think we've lost your uh, audio. Can you double check that you're can you hear me now? Yes, you can. Uh, I, I said that's a long time ago, but uh, our typical best standard practice for that would be to excavate underneath to some level, put down a fabric. If 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 we're not planting right up against the stone, um, and then you know gravel, so there's some drainage underneath it, and then the flagstone, then soil back around it. But if you wanted to, you know, you sometimes these are those are big enough that uh, that their weight alone will kind of keep them in place and you won't have any issues. So if you're you know, somewhat confident the ground's not gonna settle too much, you could just set them in loose soil and get them all level to each other. Or you could go and compact some gravel directly underneath them without using like a filter fabric. Just kind of depends on what the walkway surrounding it is going to entail. Okay, great. We also had a question about plant spacing. And I think that means when we're installing plugs or, or bare root plants or, structure trees. Um, Chris, a lot of your pilot plot was seeded, um, but if both of you could speak briefly about uh, plant spacing when you do an installation and sort of what you've learned uh, with your with your experience and about what what you know guidance that might be helpful for folks. You, you can go first if you want, Chris. Okay. Um Plant spacing, um, I'm totally against it. <laughs> I mean, uh, early on when I first started playing around with the plants, I, I would just tell people who are helping them, like, just forget about plant spacing. Why don't you just plant plants right next to each other so that they compete and they, you know, try to form a dense mass. That was kind of the goal. Um, that works. It does create a, a you know, it, it works quickly. You get a lot of plants and you get a lot of activity, but over time it kind of diminishes. And so it's it tends to be like a waste of of resources, really. So... You know, um, I don't I don't really pay attention to plant spacing. I mean, it's more of an intuitive thing. It's like, you know, I know this plant's big. It's going to need this much space. So I make sure I try to give it space, you know. But again, we like to break 
break the rules and put things next to each other, especially sedges and, you know, things that like to spread around, you know? Yeah, I, I like, Chris, I like what you're saying. I actually have a question for you, but to tie into kind of what, what they were asking, um, I, I think that, you know, in terms of like, I guess, building and managing a project for me, I, um, I, I, I'm all for what you're saying. Yeah. I think we should have three or four plants per square foot. So throw them in there. And of course, you know, these designs, uh, you can implement them to the T like on, on ours, right. Or you can be more uh, on site laying it out. I mean, there's always, almost always design tweaks, if you will, as you're, as you're building these things. So, um, but, um, you know, the thing I, that, that I, that I think you do get when you do try to plan out and lay those out is, is, is from a design perspective, like you can have these really cool, you know, drifts or curves or, or whatever that, that like Chris, you had those built and, and the beds themselves had these really cool shapes. I thought that was super, super neat. You can do that with plants too, right? Like, um, so if we're doing that, we have to have a little more control over it, but I think the way you did it is also a way to do it. And I think that is really cool. So my question is to you, um, I'm on, typically on like small projects, not a big fan of, of seeding uh, because I feel like I don't know what's going to come up over here and what's going to come up over there. And, um, and I just, and seed can be challenging on, on in small, small locations. You know, I think that, you know, no-till drilling on acres is a better application for that. What's your, I mean, do you have any, can you add to that? What do you, what do you think? I mean, because I was listening to you earlier, you know, if you don't want to spend a lot of money on plants, it seeding might be an opportunity, you know, if you could do both of those yeah. things. If you seed a little yeah. bit, depending on what time of year it is, you know, I mean, and then yeah. plant into that also. I think I think we've probably done a little bit of that, actually, you know, just to experiment. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think just one thing about plants is uh, I, it's like a tendency for us to, I, you know, I don't know, just to be breaking the habit of the plant as an object, you know, it's like we tend, we love those plants and it's like whenever they're spaced, it feels like they're like an object. Whereas if you just have a mass of plants, it's like they're one organism. I'm just, it's a yeah. preference. There's, as you said, there's no right way to do it. You know, I don't think it's a garden. So, you know, you yeah. do whatever you want really, but that's kind of how we like yeah. to do it. Yeah, no, I love it. I love it. Cool. Thank you. All right, Emily, back to you. All right. So another question. We had a couple of questions that I'm going to combine because I think they are tending in the same direction. So one was a question about what makes a good green mulch and then what also makes a good ground cover. Um, so if you have any thoughts about that uh, for, for our viewers um, who you know, might want a recommendation. I can take that one. Um, we showed a lot, a, a kind of a go-to green mulch. So, I mean, gr green mulches are more, more likely than not going to be some sort of a ground cover. I mean, sedges can also do, I mean, that's kind of up to you at some, you know, theoretical level, but you want something that uh, you want plants that are found naturally in situations where, they're going to come out. Typically, a lot of them bloom in the spring. A lot of our ground covers are, you know, early bloomers because they do their thing. And then they actually kind of want another plant to kind of smother them, I guess. A uh, uh, better word for that. But um, so plant, you know, all those kind of things are, the, you don't want a plant that doesn't want that, right? That's going to require like direct sunlight. I think the specs on plants are really cool, like Pacara is one that, uh, you know, it's sun to shade, right? And so I think of that and I think it's sun because in the, you know, forest, it's growing right now before the trees leave out. So it is full sun and then the trees leave out and now it's shaded and other plants grow over it and it is, couldn't be happier. Um, so yeah, there's so many awesome, I mean, we had Robin's plantain also in there. Um, that was that white, you know, daisy that looking plant that we put with the, the, the Pacara. That's a great one. Um, uh, Pussy Toes Antenaria is another great one. There's a bunch of really cool green mulch ground covers. And then sedges, I think someone, Emily, I don't know if this was another question or not, that somebody asked me, I thought, about sedges, right? So yep. I've kind of got some go-to ones that I like. There is so many sedges, and there's so many awesome people bringing more of them to the market. Elliot Dumler, for example. Um, you know, we need more sedges. And there's just so many cool ones that can do so many different things out there. 
But some of the easier ones in production that I think to get a hold of or grow ourselves, you know, Palm Sedge, Carrick's Breviere, Carrick's Blonda, Carrick's Pennsylvanica, um, Carrick's Radiata. Those are all, you know, and there I could keep going, but those are some. And then and in terms of grasses, you know, I mean, a lot of these, you know, urban, you know, smaller spaces, we can't be using the switch grasses and the, you know, it's just, it's too big, right? So uh, we were always trying to find that in our palette, right? The smaller ones. So blue grandma, slide oats grandma, um, pr prairie drop seed, little blue stem, you know, maybe as isolated chunks in here and there, um, or if you've got enough restrictions there where it's not going to be too tall, uh, little blue stem is great. You know, I don't, you know, Indian grass is neat. I've got some in my prairie, but I'm not, not going to spec that for a client, right? It's just going to be everywhere eventually. Um, so I think that Chris, add, if you got more plants to add to that, I think that's all, those are all really great. I mean, the other thing I would say is, you know, to add to it is a lot of times we're, if you just go out in your lawn and look to see what stuff's coming up there, the spring, the stuff that's coming up right now are tend to be annual kind of things. They, they can be. And I don't know what you mean by green mulch in terms of like, if it's a plant you want to keep for the long term, but you know, a lot of the prairie stuff, it's not coming up now. It's going to be a while. It's going to look pretty, pretty, pretty bad for a bit till late May. So one of the things that we've been doing is we will just kind of see what's coming up in those prairie gardens. And if there is a ground creeping thing, we'll just leave it there and basically encourage it to grow. So, and it kind of becomes a green mulch in and of itself, you know, so. Yeah, that, that's a really, um, that's an awesome point because um, I, I, I think, you know, maybe standard landscaping views everything, right, as a weed. Yeah. And those things can be viewed uh, if they're not detrimental to the overall health of that system as, you know, like it's just an annual, right? So it's provide, it's going to buy, it's, it's going to die and it's going to be organic matter in the soil now. And it did mulch for a little while. So yeah, I, I'm right there with you with certain species. Yeah, we should leave them. All right. Awesome. Um, this is a question, Chris, you talked pretty extensively about the water resources at the pilot plot site. Um, we did have a question for you, Will, um, and I think this is particularly about the bridge space site and the design of the building with the large overhang. Um, how is water managed on that site? Because as we know, water is still an important part of maintaining uh, native plantings. Um, and if you have areas like that overhang that are not getting water, were there, is there an irrigation system utilized? You know, what, you know, how, how are you dealing with water at the, at the bridge face site in particular? So, I, you know, maybe it's worth just talking about it overarching the, you know, the, the concept of irrigating irrigation with native plants and all that, but at that site, there is no irrigation. Um, and you're right. It does stay really dry up against that building. It is, you know, let's say 12 feet up. So, you know, rain does not just fall straight down. So rain gets in there. Uh, it gets watered. When it comes to establishment, though, that's the kind of, you know, the key for us. And, you know, one of the, again, this is a really big issue is, you know, people put plants in the ground and they get their hose out and they water the plants and the ground looks wet and maybe you touch it and it feels wet, but it's not saturated down. It, what it needs to be. And to me, that's three or four inches. Um, with new plants for 30, 45 days, I'm going to saturate the ground almost constantly, even for plants that are going to be in dry areas, because I want to encourage the roots to know to grow down and not up. And, and, um, but what we've started implementing because this was such a problem is we actually installed temporary irrigation systems, which are no, you know, fancy way of saying hoses, battery timers. We've built our own, um, you know, uh, sprinkler heads and we reuse them. We, we lease it to the client for that 30, 45 day period. They get it watered. We do have lots of clients that do have irrigation though, and that can be retrofitted to water the native plants. Um, but I am probably never going to say, Hey, let's go get a plastic irrigation system installed. It kind of goes against the whole ecological landscaping movement. However, if it's in your, if it's there, it's something that's been paid for. It's infrastructure in your yard. It's let's, use it as a tool. Like we don't need to water these things every day, but maybe we go through a really big drought period and you can kick those. The plants are going to thank you for getting a little bit of water during, you know, but native plants don't need supplemental watering after they're established. So um, that was a big diatribe on that roof overhang. Sorry. Well, thank you for that, Will. You know, it is important to keep in mind what watering means with establishing native plantings. 
In particular, we have had some conditions across the state of Missouri in the lower Midwest that, you know, we'll say they have been atypical rainfall patterns. And it's something that, you know, we need to, we still as, you know, when we're doing native landscaping, keep an eye on what type of soil moisture we've got going on in our plantings, especially with establishment. Um, oh, this is a question for you, Chris. Um, can you talk about which plants you tend to take out before they become a problem, a preemptive gardening? So, you know, you're going in and you're editing. What is it that you are looking to, you know, edit out of the pilot pot planting? Sort of the typical, we're always looking at woodies. <clears throat> so, you know, mulberries and elms, things like that, we're trying to get those out. Some things that we plant, I mean, goldenrod, we'll often try to thin goldenrod out because we love it, but it also takes over everything. So we try to thin it out. Cup plant is another one that we've used in the past or in the past because it's an amazing plant. It's a cool plant. Kids like the plant, but it really can take over and you can use it to your advantage, but also it kind of becomes a real big issue. I mean, there's so many of the prairie plants that are so big and robust that you that we've tried because they are so big and robust. And then we end up going like crud, we need to like thin these things out because they're taking over. You know, we as I said earlier, I think it's like we we put a ton of plants in, we got this a big a bunch of diversity, but now we've got this one plant taking over thing over everything. So kind of defeats the purpose of having all these other plants, you know. So I don't have a good list. I'm sorry about that, but there's so many. I mean, if you come walk with me, we can we can look at <laughs> some things. I invite you. Well, part of what you're saying, right, is that you know, you're keeping an as you're maintaining the beds, you're keeping an eye on how the different plants are behaving and what species are play and some of this is site dependent right you know what is what is really liking the site that you're on and what is it that you know you say this is this is starting to take over maybe we should edit this out reduce the number and then see because we will i think this goes back to something that both of you were emphasizing is maintaining it's not just the design integrity but if you're designing for you know plant diversity you you don't want what you don't want you know, if you're not intending an entire side of goldenrod then you're going to want to think about ways to kind of keep that goldenrod in check to maintain the diversity of your planting um will this is a question for you it's also about plant choices um so you talked about flopping onto sidewalks which is a big concern for lots of folks in Sort of more urban settings because we want to maintain those sidewalks open for mobility and access. Um, so do you have any advice on like plant choices for those kind of sidewalk edges? So plants that are going to be less likely to flop, um, shorter plants, sedges, even something that could be mowed along an edge um, and sort of maintain, you know, that that integrity. You have any 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 I any advice on plant choices for those sidewalk edges? Yeah, I, I think this is another example of, of you know, I, I and maybe I'm, I'm, I'm misreading Chris wrong, but I, I mean, I love the approach of, you know, these things are natural. Let's just let them, let them do what they're going to do. Um, and there are definitely beds where I have that opportunity, but there are areas where I, I feel like you just have to be more curated and, you know, in city areas or, or where there's sidewalks and, 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 you know, cars can't see around a corner, um, or we've started to create situations where there might be safety concerns because someone could be behind something, you know, I, I, you know, that there's a need to keep certain plants in certain areas and not let them spread. And um, when it comes to edges, there's a couple ways you can approach it. I think in general, the rule is you do short plants, right? You don't do things that get taller. I mean, things that, you know, a general sense of talking about this things that want to get taller typically are plants that are going to have other tall things around them. And that they kind of, you know, hold each other up. And when we have a sidewalk here now, there's nothing there holding it up. So where's it going to flop? So shorter things, you know, maybe things that are going to be no more than two foot, two and a half foot, um, you know, ground covers, sedges. I mean, any of the sedges I just recommended, you know, any sedge really, I mean, well, that's not true. There's some really tall, there's taller sedges, but you know, a short sedge. Another idea though, uh, is to do like a rock banding, uh, has been a, a really good solution where we've got like a 16 or, you know, 24, inch rock banding which gives you another tool that you can kind of 
make an organic shape out of. But that's, you know, people step off the sidewalk, they step in that. It can dissipate water as water rolls off the sidewalk into the bed. Um, and then you can let some, you know, like, like, uh, Rose Ravina, right? Like it can creep onto the rocks now. It's not an issue, right? Until it reaches the sidewalk. Um, so that's my general rule of thumb. I think it's just about pick, you know, you pick those courts, you pick plants that are uh, mound forming that are that, um, you know, hedge forming kind of ish. So that's all I got. <laughs> Right. Well, thank you. And I just had, there was one more question it was about sedges in sunny beds in particular. Do you have any recommendations for sun loving sedges? Yeah. I mean, um, Carex Brevier is, you know, I, you could say it's maybe a little boring, but it, it is, it's just got a really good stature to it. It gets to a certain height and it stays upright. Um, so it's a really big go-to it can handle a little bit of shade and um, I, I, you know, there's certain plants that I kind of find myself using all the time. I'm like, you gotta, will you gotta, you know, reinvent the will here. Um, but Carex Breviere I think is, is, is universally. And, you know, when we're talking about sedge, I mean, if you're just talking about a shorter type of like grass variety, Blue Grama um, is a great one. Um, you know, I don't use Buffalo grass too much. It's more of a Western Kansas plant in my opinion, but you know, a Buffalo grass, um, you know, there's several short grasses, which is going to give you the same thing that a sedge is doing. So um, if people have more questions about these things, and, you know, obviously this is a great format to do that. But if you want to dial in more with Chris or I, reach out to us and, you know, we can, you know, figure out ways to provide different things that you're, you, you know, you might need. All right. Well, thank you so much to both of you for these really wonderful yeah. presentations and really, I mean, inspiring work um, that you've both done on these gardens of excellence. Thank you so much uh, for sharing all of the work that you've put in to these projects and giving us some insight into all stages um, of, of that work and really beautiful outcomes in all cases. So as I mentioned before, uh, this webinar has been recorded and an email will be sent to participants tomorrow with the webinar link and other helpful resources. If you enjoyed this presentation, we hope that you'll join us for the Grow Native Masterclass Landscaping with Vines with Scott Woodbury on April 10th, which is gonna be awesome. Um, master classes are free for MPF members and Grow Native professional members and $15 for members of the general public. So I want to thank you all again and thanks for all of our webinar participants uh, for sticking it out through this wonderful presentation. Chris and Will, I hope you have a great evening. And so take care, everyone. Same to you. Thank you.